I want to just say welcome everybody. Welcome the people out of that are on YouTube joining us from YouTube. This is Street Live to YouTube. At least the first part of it is as well. So we'll be able to maybe maybe get some questions from those guys, and then obviously the folks in our chat is where we're going to have most people. Well, first of all, thank you. I you come very highly rep, rep, recommended from a friend of mine, Doctor uh, Gabrielle Lyon, who I'm sure you know. She said she speaks very highly of you, and I was very intrigued when I saw your profile. And that as a cardiologist, you specialize in reversing uh, atherosclerotic plaque or cardiovascular disease. So that's very uh, intriguing to, I think, most people. Um, can you start out maybe by just giving us a little bit of background, if you don't mind? Sure. So thank you for having me. And yeah, Dr. Lyon has uh, been a great uh, friend and resource of the past year and getting me into, you know, in front of people that, you know, let people share what I can kind of do. And, you know, I really do like to work on trying to get to the root cause of people's issues. So my name is Michael Twyman. I'm a physician. I'm currently located in St. Louis, Missouri. Did my conventional training here in St. Louis. And then for the past seven to eight years, been doing integrative functional cardiology. And then last year, started my own practice, which was now exclusively focused on heart attack and stroke prevention. So looking at more than just your traditional cholesterol, blood pressure, blood sugar, really looking at maybe three to 400 different things that can drive plaque being put into your arteries. I guess we'll get into this in a little bit. There's people talking about coronary artery calcium scans because I, I saw a fellow yesterday, you know, said that, uh, you know, he saw a reversal and went from 72 to like 40 or something, some, some kind of not insignificant decrease. Now, again, the question is, is it done on the same machine and so on and so forth? But yeah. let me ask you just kind of an off the wall, kind of an off the wall question. I mean, maybe not it's too off the wall. Um, I saw a recent discussion, and when we're talking about cardiovascular uh, reversal, there's a fellow named Ivor Cummins, who has been talking with other people, I think I named Peter Thute, if I'm not mistaking his name, talking about seeing that he's reversed some calcification in his own self and has recommended ways to do that with uh, you know, dietary interventions and some supplements. But one of the thoughts is that, you know, our, if we look at a traditional model, you know, LDL cholesterol builds up, there's some damage in the ar arterial tree, it then interdigitates itself. But the other thought is that um, what, and correct me if I'm wrong, but histologically, we see that the, the 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 sort of the plaque or the uh, buildup of uh, cholesterol seems to first appear at the at the junction between the tunica intima and the uh, muscular layer, the tunica media first. And there's some thought that that is brought in actually by the vasovasorum, which are the as, you, as I'm sure you're well, they're they're the blood vessels that feed the bigger arterioles and the arteries, and so that. Um, it may not be just a direct migration of cholesterol from the, you know, from the, the the artery itself going through there, but it's actually coming through the smaller, almost you know, the smaller base of zoom, almost capillary like, and that is secondary to damage that's already there, and that's why some people are claiming that cholesterol is a dependent factor, and that and and so it's dependently damaging depending upon are we seeing, you know, other things, you know vascular damage, inflammation, oxidation, glycation, you know, so on and so forth. You can speculate as to why that is. Do you feel that that, is, is there some truth to that or is that just kind of just wild speculation? I don't think it's necessarily wild speculation, but I haven't heard the, uh, uh, the theory that it's coming from the, the smaller blood vessels per se. But, you know, I tend to tell patients that, you know, it's all about the LDL particles that are actually transporting the cholesterol and triglycerides around the system and the LDLC that you see on your traditional panel. And it's normal for the cholesterol to transport through the lumen where the blood is flowing and going into the walls of the artery. But most of the time, the cholesterol is supposed to then come back out, go in the lumen and keep going and doing what it's going to do. It's only really a problem with that the cholesterol gets stuck in the wall of the artery and starts getting oxidized or damaged. Then you get the macrophages, you know, migrating into the, uh, the walls of the artery and starting to form foam cells. The macrophages basically eat the cholesterol and then, you know, try to seal it off from the rest of the system. If you shut off the inflammatory process, then the plaque won't continue to grow. So it's mostly the inflammation in the walls of the artery that's the big concern. And yes, the calcium score test, that's, you know, a bread and butter test that I routinely do for patients. But another one that's, you know, very useful to do is the, uh, the carotid intimomedial thickness scan, the CIMT. It's an ultrasound of the carotid artery. And it's similar to the technology they use for a carotid duplex, but you're not necessarily looking for stenosis. You shouldn't be seeing stenosis in an, an earlier you know, type of patient. But if the wall is starting to get thickened, that's a marker first that the wall is inflamed, but then also a marker that plaque is more likely going to be keep building up in the you know, 60,000 miles of blood vessels that you do have. 
let me ask you, and I didn't, forgive me, I didn't ask you this. Are you a guy that does interventional stuff? Or are you, do you do the cath lab stuff? Or are you mostly doing the, the, uh, the, the in the office type cardiology? So for the past year, I've focused on uh, office-based uh, um, medicine. I was a invasive trained cardiologist for many years doing diagnostic casts. I was uh, you know, doing, you know, corneal angiograms and, you know, transesophageal echoes, but really kind of give up a lot of the procedures to be able to, to focus on the prevention aspect. So let me ask you a little more detail about that CIMT because, you know, obviously I, I, from my understanding, the relative dynamic nature of that um, relative to, say, a CAC score, which, you know, obviously the calcification is going to take much longer to uh, deposit. And then, you know, if it is reversing, which again is still controversial, although I've heard anecdotally that it has, that probably is a much slower, slower process. So what has been your experience with how fast can someone change What's going on with their with their carotid intermediate thickness type score? So, you know, from personal experience, you know, I don't have a lot of uh, longitudinal patients yet because my practice is just like one year old. But um, but from doctors I've trained under, you know, seeing their reports, you know, within six to twelve months, if people make a big change in their lifestyle, their supplements or medications, they'll start seeing regression of that inflammation of the wall and your arterial age, um, it starts going down. You know, as you age, your artery is supposed to get slightly thicker and thicker. And you know, when you do this test, if you're a 45 year old man and your arteries say they're 65, well, you're 65 years in, you know, inside. It doesn't matter what you look like on the outside. Um, and so they implement these you know, changes in their life and you know, their arterial age is going down. So ideally if the you know, inflammation in the wall of the artery and your carotid is going down, then any plaque that's in your coronary arteries should be going down as well. You know, the, CIMT and the calcium score test, you know, they probably correlate, you know, 70 to 80%. You know, they're not one for one or 100%, but, you know, if you see improvement in one, you're likely getting improvement in the other. And you're very right, you know, on the calcium score test, you know, I've had patients who have had scores less than 100 go back to zero. That's not common. You know, normally it's, it just kind of freezes where it's at and stops going up. And all comers, you know, over the age of 40 or so, six out of 10 people are going to have a positive score. And if you do nothing, change nothing in your lifestyle, supplements or meds, it's going to increase by about 20% per year. If you can freeze it, that's optimal. But, you know, I have seen it start to regress slightly in some people. Yeah, and I've got, I'm just, just before we get into that, because I think this stuff is, is really fascinating. We really need to delve into that pretty, well, pretty much. But I've got somebody from Facebook asking me about, uh, you know, autoimmune diseases in general and things like Hashimoto's. Now, we know that certain diseases like say lupus for instance if you have lupus and as you know that has an effect on blood vessels as well the risk for cardiovascular disease goes up tremendously and i would assume that's the whatever we want to call it autoimmune inflammatory vascular damaging part can you can you speak to i mean i guess that lends credence to the fact that that these things do uh, become part of the etiology Correct. And, you know, autoimmune conditions are, you know, something I frequently see in my practice. And, you know, sometimes I pick them up almost accidentally in some of my advanced uh, blood work testing, you know, high sensitivity CRP is kind of a bread and butter cardiovascular test, but um, there are other markers I check, you know, some called myeloproxidase, LPPLA2. And if these enzymes are elevated, it means your arteries are inflamed. And then you got to kind of dig in, you know, why are the arteries inflamed? You know, Hashimoto's or, you know, having underactive thyroid due to an autoimmune condition is extremely common. And then you got to, you know, figure out, you know, is it, you know, induced by grains, is it induced by, you know, something else in their, in their environment that's really driving their immune system to start attacking their thyroid. But before they had all these really fancy cholesterol testing, if you had an underactive thyroid, then your LDL receptor doesn't work very well and your cholesterol levels went high. And so that used to be the old way to know if somebody actually had a thyroid issue is that their cholesterol numbers would really start jacking up. Yeah, and I think we are getting a little more sophisticated, a little more nuanced in this. And, you know, I think the, uh, well, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think the sort of the, maybe the 1980s mantra that if your LDL cholesterol is high, then therefore all people are created equal. And that's the only thing we got to worry about. And let's put you on a low fat diet and maybe, maybe throw some Lipitor in the water. Uh, I remember when I was in medical school, I, I would hear the, the family practice, attending physicians mentioning that, yeah, we should put Lipitor in the water. And that was what I was hearing back, you know, 20 some years ago. And it's, it's kind of surprising that we really haven't 
advanced that much in the majority, but there is a significant minority of people that are looking at some of these other markers and saying, wait a minute, maybe there's more to the story than, than, than that sort of thing. So as you evaluate somebody, well, let's just talk about risk for now, and then we can talk about how we're reversing. So are all people with high cholesterol levels at the same level of risk? Uh, I mean, granted that we have a population in the U.S. where the vast majority of the people have some kind of metabolic issue that's going on, and so it becomes very easy to paint everybody with a broad brush. But if we want to really do the work and you know spend some time and, and do a little nuance, how would you sort of how would you stratify different risk factors for different people in different different cohorts? Right, and I think that's a you know very good question. You know, is who is metabolically healthy and you know, metabolically flexible and, you know, who's insulin resistant, pre-diabetic and at a much higher, higher vascular risk. You know, as I said earlier, you know, cholesterol wasn't put into your system to give you heart attacks. You know, you need your cholesterol for, you know, make your sex hormones, make bile acids, make, you know, most of your brain's cholesterol. So it's mostly the inflammatory story. That's the big thing. So, you know, first go looking for those type of things. Um, so, you know, high sense of ECRP and then actually looking at the arteries themselves, you know, the Framingham's, you know, data, was, you know, the best they had in the, you know, the 60s and 70s, you know, looking at cholesterol and blood pressure, but that's a big cohort of people. You know, it doesn't tell you it's your end of one, you know, do you have disease? Do you have something to worry about? And that's where kind of actually looking non-invasively at the arteries with a, you know, a calcium score test or a CIMP tells you, okay, I'm actually developing plaque in my arteries. You know, what can I do about it at this stage before I even go on to have that first heart attack or stroke? Um, so I'm going to actually, you know, looking at the arteries. And then there's a third test I, you know, will recommend in, you know, younger cohorts of people is a, uh, an endopath test or an endothelial function test. You know, endothelium is the inner lining of your blood vessels. That's actually the first sign that vascular disease is happening is your endothelium stops making nitric oxide and becomes dysfunctional. And you can test that with a couple other, uh, other testing. And I try to do that in, you know, patients that are very, uh, you know, hardcore, like, hey, I don't end up like my dad. Okay, well, let's see how healthy your endothelium is because if your endothelium is healthy, you're good to go. If you're anything that's not healthy, you got maybe five, six years, you know, you can change stuff and you're not going to put plaque down in the arteries in the first place. But as you mentioned, you know, once you get the cholesterol numbers back, are they all equal? Absolutely not. You know, it depends on, you know, what their context is. And, you know, one of the um, kind of risk guides I, I tend to use now is called the Astro Charm. You know, it's plugging in, you know, your CRP, it's plugging in uh, different things, you know, plugs in your calcium score test, and it really gives you a, a much better measurement of what your 10-year risk of a heart attack is. And that's usually what, you know, people actually care about. I don't care what your cholesterol is. I care about your risk of having a heart attack or dying from a heart attack. Yeah, I think, and I think that's a really, uh, you know, and I, lo I love the fact that I don't care what your cholesterol is, and although it may be relevant, uh, I care about your risk for, for heart disease, which I think is a much more, you know, what I would care about as a patient, you know, when I look at, you know, why am I actually in your office? I don't care if my cholesterol is 70 or 92 or 162. I care if I'm going to drop dead of heart attack. And so I think that's, uh, uh, you know, a very fair way to look at it. So let's, um, you know, when, so let, let's just put it this way. So you're, you're in a, in case you don't know, I'm sitting here with a sign that says meat RX behind me. We're a bunch of meat eaters, you know, a bunch of meatheads that have all decided for various reasons that uh, eating meat has been a significant benefit to our health. Some of us have what would, what would many people traditionally would say is relatively high cholesterol and would be concerned about our risk for cardiovascular disease. Now, some of us are saying, I'm okay with that. I would rather feel good because I no longer have an autoimmune disease or I no longer have debilitating uh, mental health disorders or gastrointestinal issues or whatever. My quality of life is more important than am I going to die of a heart attack in 30 years or not. But if for those people that are saying, hey, I'm good with my LDL cholesterol being 250 or 300, what? how would you manage those people? How would you additionally uh, sort of would you tell those patients, hey, you're crazy, you need to switch out, start eating more monounsaturated fat? Or would you, would you say, well, let's check this X, Y, and Z? And how would you, how would you sort of evaluate those, those people? That's a great question. And I've you know, definitely taken care of patients who are, you know, uh, on the spectrum of doing a full carnivore. And I just tell people, you know, test and guess, you know, know what your baseline is before you make a dietary change or any major change in your system. That's kind of what the, you know, the whole full story of like biohacking is, you know, it's, you know, testing something on yourself, seeing what the result is, and then making a change in that variable. Um, so if somebody was coming to me and saying, I was thinking about doing a carnivore diet and they weren't currently, 
you know, what I would do is I would, you know, probably do this test, you know, have a calcium score test, a CIMT, and probably an endopat. Okay, how healthy are your arteries right now? Do a comprehensive blood work panel. What are your numbers, your inflammatory markers before you went under this type of a nutrition regimen? And then, you know, I'm much more bigger in the epigenetics, you know, how your environment impacts your genes. But, you know, one gene I would check, I would check the APOE gene. Because the people who are APOE2 or APOE4, they tend not to respond as well to doing a carnivore diet than the ones that are APOE3s. And when you say response, how do you determine the, the response? You're talking about the, with, with regard to cholesterol numbers and inflammation numbers, or is there some other? Because I know there is a lot of there is a lot of concern around saturated fat and a, particularly APOE4. I've, I've seen a lot, a lot of people trying to unpack that. So I've got some dogs in the background. I want to participate. So I was just going to ask, you know, uh, when you, so if, if, if someone has an APOE4 gene and you say they're not responding as well, what, in what regard are you, are you making that sort of uh, assessment? Mainly as it is being a fat transporter, um, you know, the people who have an APOE4, you know, I've seen, you know, again, and you know, this being a traditionally trained cardiologist at one point in my career, you know, seeing LDLCs of you know 350, that that's still gonna make your eyes kind of say, okay, like is this something that you really want this person to be doing for the next 20 to 30 years? You know, if they're you know if they're gung ho and say, hey, I'm going to do this, then my answer is gonna be, you know, please get you know your CIMTs, your endopatch yearly, and show me that your arteries are staying healthy doing this. If they are, then you're one of those people that you're gonna tolerate this. But the first sign that you start showing that you're putting plaque in your arteries. You got to have that discussion. Is the nutrition thing the most important thing for you at this point? All right, let's let's jump in a little bit and delve into reversal because that's what you know. Because there are some people that come in, they'll come into you know. It, it doesn't matter what diet you're doing. They'll be in. I've got a, I've got a coronary calcium can of six hundred. I was very fortunate that mine was zero, and I'm you know fifty three, and I've been eating high fat ketogenic diets and carnivore diets for several years now. But for those people that are starting at you know whatever thick carotids on a CIMT or maybe a calcium score that is less than desirable, moderate, moderate or high risk. How do you, how do you, how do you, how do you, how does someone reverse that? Or how do you, what's been a successful strategy you've used? So, you know, always going to start with, you know, the simplest things first is focusing on lifestyle. You know, I usually teach kind of four pillars, you know, nutrition, exercise. Okay. That's, you know, bread and butter cardiology, but even they don't necessarily do it, you know, the right way to educate people on that. But if, you know, if it was diet and exercise for everything, everybody would already be doing the right exercise and nutrition. We all would be having this discussion. But how do you deal with the stress in your environment? Obviously with, you know, a pandemic going on right now, a lot of people have more stress in their life. If high stress, you have high cortisol, raises your blood sugar, high adrenaline, raises your blood pressure, puts more risk on your vascular system. And then the fourth pillar I usually teach about is sleep. You know, if you don't sleep well, None of the stuff we're talking about is really going to matter. You can eat as healthy as you want. You can exercise like a beast. But if you don't sleep, you don't consolidate those gains or those nutrition. So focusing on those kind of four pillars. And then, you know, looking at uh, how you would, you know, regress the plaque is, you know, first shut off the things that are putting the inflammation in the arteries in the first place. So, you know, I tell people plaque in your arteries kind of like an abscess or it's a pimple on your artery. You know, it's a volcano in the artery that's, you know, ready to rupture. If you shut off the inflammation, put a real thick cap over the plaque, well, now it's just kind of sandwiched into the wall of the artery. It's going to be there probably forever. And as long as it doesn't rupture, that's all we really care about, that it doesn't rupture and cause a heart attack or stroke. So there's things that have been shown to put thicker caps over the plaque, you know. High dose, high quality omega-3s, you know, EPA, DHA has been shown to do that. Vitamin K2, um, more than K7 than in K4, but vitamin K2 tells the calcium to stay in your bones and teeth, not building up so much in the arteries. And there's smaller studies that show there are some plaque regression, mainly in the carotids, with vitamin K2. There's a particular type of garlic, chyloic aged garlic, that also has shown some data on calcium scores, studied at UCLA, at least stabilizing it, and sometimes even actually getting the calcifications to regress. So that's kind of from the lifestyle and the supplements. You know, prescriptions, you know, they'll have the role at times, you know, somebody has a stent, they've had bypass surgery, they're high risk, and they're, you know, quote, doing everything. Sometimes you're going to throw the kitchen sink at them to kind of shut down these inflammatory pathways. And so that's the one thought that, you know, people are on a stent, you know, it's not necessarily that it's slowing cholesterol the main way that it works, it's that it's actually stabilizing that plaque from a soft, vulnerable plaque to a more hard calcified plaque that's not going to cause that heart attack or stroke. And so that's kind of one of the uh, side note is, you know, you know, certain statins, 
actually will raise your calcium score test. And so you think the risk is going up, but it's probably turning that salt vulnerable plaque into hard calcified plaque that's not necessarily going to cause the problem. Yeah, that's one of the uh, things that I think is interesting, you know, because calcification is our body trying to protect ourselves. You know, as an orthopedic surgeon, you know, that's what happens when you fracture yourself. Your body starts laying down calcium. It's trying to protect you. We see that in infections. We'll see, uh, you know, my, you know, uh, you know, exogenous or, you know, we see myositis ossificans where, where you know, irritated muscle will have calcium. Sometimes these big bruises, people get these horrible hematomas and there'll be calcium and then we'll mistake that for a tumor, uh, which is kind of scary for some people because it's hard to tell the difference. Um, there is, uh, um, so what are you, so what is your sort of approach? Um, well, let, let's talk about this because I think this is fair and I've talked to other cardiologists. And so if you've got somebody with, with post-secondary, uh, or, or sorry, secondary prevention. I've got a guy, you know, say a guy just had a heart attack six weeks ago. He's got everything in place. He's inflamed. Uh, he is, you know, he's got diabetes or pre-diabetes. Uh, he's, you know, he's got all the, all the, all the things. Or maybe he's a smoker. You know, maybe not. Hopefully, not a smoker anymore. But you know, what, whatever caused him to have a heart attack, he had, he had the ingredients necessary. And very, and, and as you know, some people have high cholesterol in that situation. Some don't have particularly high cholesterol, and they still have a heart attack. Is that a time where you think there is a role for dropping our cholesterol in that, in that, in that particularly in that acute secondary situation? And how do you, how do you like to do that if that isn't, if that is indeed the case? So that's a great question, and yeah, the data still. Is- pretty close to this is that, you know, half the people that come into the hospital with a heart attack have, quote, normal cholesterol. And so, you know, it never made much sense to me that that's the only metric we should be focusing on once they came out of the hospital with the heart attack. And so, you know, maybe, yes, you know, they got a new stand, they got bypassed. Okay, well, you're using the stand to stabilize, the, you know, the endothelium, you're lowering inflammation at that time. And then you can have the discussion, you know, months down the road, you know, are they on the right dose of stand or not? You know, fortunately, in the past year, with my kind of transition to you know more outpatient based, I can literally count on my hand that I had one guy I haven't in mind this past year, and it was actually that as a guy that didn't follow me up for a year, so he wasn't necessarily doing my usual protocol. So now he's back on protocol, and I anticipate he's not going to have any more you know more events. Um, but you know, if somebody has had an event, yeah, they'd come see me. I would do a comprehensive blood work panel and see you know what what has been missed, you know what inflammatory markers are being missed, you know. Or is their vitamin D level 12 because, you know, there's somebody who lives inside in front of, you know, computers all day long. You know, what is their, what is their thyroid function? You know, if they're hypothyroid, well, you know, fix the thyroid. So, you know, can take a very comprehensive root cause analysis. You know, why, why is this person having an event? You know, definitely cholesterol played a role in, you know, the plaque rupture, but uh, you need to dive deeper to figure out why that's happening. So when you say uh, protocol, I mean, what is what is the general protocol? If you don't know, mind sharing, sharing what you, how you, I mean, is there a baseline? Well, I mean, start with nutrition, maybe diet, baseline diet, obviously type of exercise. How much? For for you, you, you kind of mentioned the pillars, which I think we all agree about: sleep and exercise. And but the diet part is still really kind of, uh, sort of controversial. I mean, there's people who point to the Caldwell Esselton, uh, Dean Ornish fat as low as you can tolerate and, you know, and, and maybe even restrict calories quite a bit and then all the lifestyle things. So how do you, how do you, so what is your protocol? So, I mean, obviously everybody's going to be, you know, individualized and it's going to depend a lot on, uh, you know, your mitochondrial haplotype. So this is basically what I've been really focused on in the past two to three years is, yes, I'm a cardiologist, um, but, you know, if I focus on optimizing your mitochondria, uh, I make you better in so many different ways. So your mitochondria are the organelles in your cells that make energy for you. That's their main function. And most of your mitochondria are in your heart and brain. You also have a lot of them in your skeletal muscle. And so figuring out what breaks your mitochondria and reversing those things that break them. Um, so, you know, like I said, focus on high quality sleep. If they don't sleep well, that's where I'm going to start initially. Um, and then from a nutrition standpoint, you know, I'm you know, not necessarily, you know, you know, hardcore one nutrition path or the other, it's really looking at, you know, what deficiency they have in their diet, looking at, you know, again, their mitochondrial haplotype determines a little bit, you know, are they somebody who's going to do better on a high fat diet? Or, you know, is it somebody who has a uh, equatorial haplotype? And your haplotype is essentially, um, you can get this on 23andMe, it'll be the, uh, essentially where your maternal 
uh, mitochondrial came from. You get all your mitochondria from your mom's line. So if you ever see me in the office, I'm always asking family history about your mom and your mom's mom, because if they had autoimmune conditions, they have cancer, they had heart disease, that's your starting, you know, starting package, essentially, your mitochondria, your starting batteries. You know, if they were sick people, you're much more likely to break down earlier in life. But your haplotype also somewhat can determine a little bit, you know, what foodstuffs you're more likely to tolerate. And it really is based off of, you know, where you're at in the world at that time. You know, I'm very big into heliotherapy or how the sun programs your, your systems. And if you, you know, are eating a high carb diet and you're on the equator, you have high UV light 12 hours a day, 365 days of the year, you're probably going to get away with it a little bit better. You're, you know, 40th degree, way high north, and you're eating a ton of carbohydrates out of season, especially, your body's not going to do very well with that. And if, you know, if you really want to go down the road of uh, talking about deuterium, that's really the key is, you know, how much deuterium you're getting in your diet at that point. But typically my main protocol would be, I really try to focus on people focusing on the circadian rhythms. You know, your circadian rhythm, your 24-hour cycle is programmed by the light that enters your eye, hits your skin, but also the timing that your nutrients come into your system. So focusing on time-restricted eating, mainly telling people eat from sun up to sundown and giving themselves at least three to four hours of nothing coming into their system before they go to bed. Yeah, you know, sure. If you, you know, if you can do you know, one meal a day or two meals a day, that's fine. But stopping, you know, four hours before you go to bed turns off the liver and the gut clocks. There's a little genes that get turned off at night and then your body's able to do the repair and, you know, things that it needs to do while you're sleeping. Um, so focusing on time restriction, High quality protein, a lot that was learned from Dr. Lyon, you know, how do you stimulate your muscles and you know get muscle protein synthesis? And then I focus on, you know, getting the healthy fat, especially DHA. Uh, DHA is not used for energy. Use DHA from your omega-3 sources to basically capture energy from your environment and then transmit that energy to your cells. And you get DHA mainly from seafood. You can get it from grass-fed, you know, products. Um, just the concentrations can be much lower on grass-fed products, but you know, the DHA is critical for brain health and also overall mitochondrial health. I mean, I'm just going to jump around a little bit. Um, particle size versus uh, particle number. You know, a lot of people, I mean, there's there's so many metrics now to look at cholesterol. You know, it's, sure. is it oxidized? Is it, is it glycated? Is it big fluffy? Is it small dense? Uh, I, was, I suspect the truth is somewhere in the middle. But, I mean, are you, because there's people that will say, They'll say it doesn't matter what your particles look like. All particles are atherogenic, and it's it's the, the biggest factor is the number of them, uh, and and therefore we should sort of not really take any comfort in the fact that we have you know pattern A big fluffy particles versus you know the pattern B. What are your thoughts on that? Is there is there validity to any of that stuff? It is still somewhat of a. Uh, um gray zone in ways, but you know, the, the biggest predictor risk still is your LDL particle number or your APOB. Um, I tend to check more LDL particle numbers just by the, you know, the training I went through. Uh, but particles are like the cars that drive the cholesterol around the system. More cars on the highway, more likely there's gonna be a traffic jam. So still looking at the overall number of LDL particles. And for somebody who's had an event, heart attack, stroke, got intervened on, probably an LDL particle number of a thousand is kind of where you want to have them be. Um, you know, the size is secondary after the number and the bigger, fluffier, you know, particles, you know, I usually tell people, you know, your endothelium is like a tennis net. You know, the bigger, fluffy particles are like tennis balls. They're not going to get through the net as easily. You know, if you have really small, dense particles, it's like a golf ball. It's easier to get through the net. But the, the smaller particles, those are mostly driven partly by genetics, but driven by being metabolically unhealthy. You know, insulin resistance or prediabetes are the biggest things that really drive those small LDL particles. The small LDL particles, they essentially stick around in the system for like five days, where the big particles stick around in the system for about a day or so. And the longer time that they're staying in the system, they are just more things they're exposed to. They're more likely to get oxidized the longer they stay in. And it's once those small ones get oxidized, that's more likely the thing that's really driving them to get stuck and remain in the arteries and get chewed up by the macrophages. When you say oxidize, what is driving oxidation in, in your mind? Is it just this, this chronic inflammatory state and i know inflammation i know that this uh, just to put it in context i mean inflammation is something our body does naturally there's a normal role for inflammation inflammation like when i exercise there's some inflammation that goes on so there's inflammation in itself is not necessarily bad but somehow you know there's people that have chronic inflammatory conditions which 
sent, tend to be bad, and maybe this chronic irritant that's driving the inflammation. So how, do, how does the oxidation seem to occur? So, you know, the way, way I think about oxidation is, you know, when you eat food, you got to combust it down into, you know, the main food stuff. So, you know, sunlight photosynthesis grows a plant. You either eat the plant or eat the animal that ate the plant, and then your body has to reverse photosynthesis. So once the food stuff gets into your system, you know, it's not fat, protein, carbohydrates that go into your mitochondria. They ultimately get converted into protons and electrons. And as you're pumping the protons through these gradients, the electrons are going down the respiratory chains. At the end of the, you know, the mitochondria, there's this thing called ATPase. It's like a little top. The faster it spins, the more ATP pops out. And so all food stuffs ultimately get broken down into those electrons. And fat-based products just have more electrons. The carbohydrate ones have more energy. And so it sort of depends on, you know, I did fail to mention earlier in the nutrition part was that, you know, other than time restricted, really do like people to focus on a seasonal eating approach. So if it's growing locally in your environment, then the sun grew it, your body eats it at that time of year, your body has a match. You know, your body's like a barcode in the mitochondria, you know, deciphering what's going on in your environment. You're way north and you're eating bananas way north. Bananas don't grow way up north in January. You just technically can eat it, but your body sees this as this was grown in a lot of sunlight. Your skin and eyes know that it's freezing outside. That's one of the things that's going to drive a lot of the inflammation. But the oxidation is, you know, once the food stuff's into your mitochondria, you know, it's ultimately going to get converted into metabolic water and um, carbon dioxide that you're going to breathe out. But oxygen is, you know, the terminal electron acceptor. There's going to be reactive oxygen species getting made during that process. And, you know, oxidative stress in small doses is, you know, hermetic. It's supposed to happen. It's just when it becomes higher and higher and higher because you're, you know, abusing uh, your systems and not letting it recover, some of those reactive oxygen species kind of leak out and start wreaking havoc on the system. Yeah. And again, that's a nice point that uh, oxidation is also normal and we have endogenous antioxidants, glutathione and many others that deal with that. And there's, there's sort of a balance there. And I know that there's, you know, for some people, um, you know, they think that taking in all these exogenous antioxidants, in fact, if you look at particularly when, when it comes in a, in a pill form, you know, some of the vitamins, the studies outcomes tend not to be very good. So there's some thought that, you know, we have a system that's well designed. And maybe if, if you work within the framework, which, which we're designed, which would include some of the diurnal stuff, some of the seasonal stuff, some of the perhaps human appropriate approaches to food. I think the main problem is we are not even, even approximating that with our modern environment, whether it's due to, you know, the fact that we spend most of the day inside in climate controlled area, we're not out in the sunshine. Uh, many of us are living in places that maybe ancestrally we would have never been to or had access. And we have access to food, like you said, 24-7. Uh, I, I, it shocks me that they're trying to teach, you know, the, the Inuit up in Nunavut, uh, northern Canada, how to grow uh, grow uh, carrots with greenhouses so that they can, they can <laughs> incorporate that into their diet so they can have a balanced diet, which... You know, when you look at the balanced diet sheet, many of those foods don't even exist on the same continent, you know, naturally. So we have this just, we are so far, and, and it's not even to mention, you know, the industrial food where many foods have just been invented in the last, you know, 50 years. It, 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 I kind of shudder to think that we've just, the USDA has just approved cotton uh, for human consumption uh, by, by GMO engineering uh, out a substance called Gossipol. And so they'll be able to grind up cotton seeds and you know, put them in processed foods and make a make a paste out the, out of them, and that and that's to me that's a little bit crazy. Um, obviously, you probably are not a proponent of the standard American diet, the highly processed diet. Um, do you, what are your thoughts on? Do you find that there may be uh, maybe just in general with health because health is obviously maybe you know as a cardiologist, obviously you're going to focus on cardiovascular disease because that's what you're trained to do, and it's one of our big you know, number one killers and most parts of the world uh, but there's a lot of things that kill people and we have a lot of sick people that have a lot of things cancer neurodegenerative disease uh, mental health disorders can you speculate as to what you think may be the major drivers of those types of things i mean that's it's broken mitochondria and mainly driven by 
you know, broken circadian rhythm. You know, people aren't meant to live indoors. Uh, they're not supposed to be in front of technology 12 hours a day. You know, these things program your systems to make different hormones and neurotransmitters, you know, based off that information. Your mitochondria are always sensing the environment, what's going on. And now with the ubiquitous use of our technology, those can interfere with your mitochondria as well. And so wherever your mitochondria break, that's basically where you're going to get a disease. And so focusing on the things that repair the mitochondria, I mean, the, the three necessary things for life on any planet are light, water, and magnetism. Light mainly by sunlight and avoiding artificial light at night so your body can release melatonin appropriately. You know, water, you know, drinking clean sources of water, but your body makes water. You make a lot of water by eating healthy fats. You know, by 100 grams of fat, you make like 110 grams of water inside your cell. And it's the water that your mitochondria make that's even more important than the water you're drinking. And then the magnetism part of it, that's mostly basically um, a complicated idea um, of how your mitochondria are holding energy in them. You know, if you don't have a good magnetic field, you don't sense that it's nighttime, you don't repair as well, but also energy isn't made as effectively in the mitochondria. You know, Earth has all three, light, water, magnetism. Mars does not have a magnetic field. Therefore, life doesn't really exist on Mars. So if you focus on things that boost those three things, you boost the energy production of the mitochondria, and you get out of the way of the way the body needs to repair itself, the body has an amazing ability to, to heal itself. Yeah, I mean, my, my comment on that was, you know, we've got an N equals one as to what's required for life because we only have one planet where we know life exists so very well. You might find another planet that doesn't have, does not have a magnetic field and life exists there. So it'd be interesting. But it's also interesting to, to, to sort of think about this stuff. Um, we know that the, the, the Earth's magnetic field flips every once in a while. I mean, the polo is just completely reversed. I can't remember the frequency. Maybe it's a few every few hundred years or something like that. Do you postulate that that would have a interesting effect on human mitochondria? And how do we assess mitochondrial health directly? Because that's that ain't easy to do for most people. That's exactly right. And uh, I don't know the frequency, but you're right. You know, the magnetic fields do shift and, you know, your mitochondria are sensing that magnetic shift. Um, you know, during the daytime, the magnetic fields are lower because of the sunlight lowers the magnetic fields. And then at nighttime, the magnetic fields come up and your body is able to sense that. But if you sleep with your phone by your head at the middle of the night, you know, it acts like a radar jammer and your mitochondria don't sense that magnetic change. Um, you know, how do you directly assess the mitochondria? There's not a clinical way yet. You know, there's some experimental ways that uh, children in the hospital of Philadelphia, they can take your mitochondria out and actually assess it. And, you know, that's more useful for children born with uh, genetic abnormalities where they don't make the proper mitochondria. But essentially anybody who comes down with some type of, you know, chronic fatigue, autoimmune condition, cancer, heart disease, they by definition have some type of mitochondrial dysfunction. And then whatever you can do to kind of make the mitochondria make more energy, they're less likely to have second events then. Um, so, you know, if you're, you know, sleeping well, you recover well, you're doing all the activities you want to do, you probably have pretty good mitochondria. You know, if your mom, your grandma on your mom's side had disease at early age, you might not do bad as long as you're doing the right things in your environment, but you basically could be born 30 years old and you're more likely to break down earlier than somebody else. So it's really it almost always ends up being an end of one. It's going to be, you know, impossible to do a randomized controlled trial that puts 100 people in each group and says, okay, do this exact thing, and you're always going to have longevity, you know, because it can depend on, you know, where you're at in the world, you know, what latitude, how you're fueling the body, how you move it, how you deal with your own stress. So, you know, there's some guidelines that you can put people towards, but, you know, it's the test, don't guess, you know, if you're going to make a change in nutrition, get some kind of baseline lab or heart rate variability metric or whatever you want to measure, Make the change and then see what happens. Yeah, I think that's that's pretty good general advice there. And the question is, what do you measure? You know, and that and that's a question I sometimes struggle with because one of the things, and I've been highly criticized of this because I say that you know some of the labs we use with the standard reference ranges may not apply, particularly when it comes to baseline nutrition values. You know, how much. You know, you know. I, I just know I've read, read too many studies and know how much dynamic variability from day to day certain labs have, and so I'm like. What if I tested it on Tuesday rather than Thursday? Am I going to get a different result? And we see a lot of sort of long lack. You know, the, the classic sort of answer is, you know, you, you go into the doctor and he pulls you up and your your total cholesterol is 202 total. And, and he says, well, you know what? We're going to put you on this drug for the rest of your life. 
And, and that's the level of depth they go into because as you probably know and as I know as a, as a person practice, that have practiced many years in the system, the system is not designed for nuance and taking time. It's, it's, it's a throughput, high throughput. You know, there's a lot of algorithm-based decision-making and sometimes that patient doesn't match that algorithm. You know, you know, unfortunately, most of the population does, but, you know, when you have that, that one patient in front of you that says, hey, maybe you're not in this cohort of the standard American eating diet person that's overweight and pre-diabetic or insulin resistant and so on and so forth. But uh, let me ask you, so you said you've now, you said there's been some people with CAC scores of uh, 100 or less, and you've seen that drop down to zero. Um, do you have any um, desire or thought about maybe publishing some case studies with that? Because I think that might be helpful. Because uh, currently what we hear is, uh, particularly from the plant based cloud, that the only proven method of reversing cardiovascular disease is a low fat plant based diet. And when I look at, like, particularly uh, uh, um, Ornish's study, I was very underwhelmed by the level of change. I mean, it was, it was like the average stenosis rate was 41%, and they dropped it down to 38%, which is, to me, almost clinically meaningless. But yet they're, they're, they're talking about it like the heat is you know, took people and gave them new hearts. But uh, so what are your thoughts about uh, getting some more data in the literature? That, that's a great question. And, you know, right now I'm set up as a solo practitioner. Um, I'm, you know, keeping you know track of my patients that are doing these uh, testing and I, I should have some more data in the next six to 12 months on, you know, on truly how these people are responding to these changes that I'm uh, working on with them. Um, I'm not an academic. I've never been that way. Um, but I'll definitely keep track of the data, and if it looks like there's a good trend, uh, then I'll start, you know, sharing. You know, okay, this is my experience with my patients, and this is what I've seen with them. Um, but back to your question about Ornish, you know, it's that his trial um, also is, you know, very um, not a just a plain nutrition trial. I mean, he had people stop smoking, they were exercising, they were doing some type of stress management, meditation. You know, they had community support. Um, you know, it was kind of the full meal deal that really helped things. And some of the thoughts are that, you know, they, they got like, you know, four steps ahead by doing those things, but they took three steps back because of the nutrition, but it still looked like it was a positive thing. Um, so, you know, can a plant-based diet work for people? It can, but you need to really test and see for your end of one, is it working for you? Um, and so, you know, I think, uh, I think everybody, you know, has a way to, um, you know, measure what's going on in their systems. You know, there's different, you know, heart rate variability. There's, you know, what you're fasting blood sugar, you're fasting insulin, you know, your, you know, omega-3 index. You can monitor these things fairly, you know, cheaply and inexpensively and see, you know, if you're making changes in your environment, how's it affecting you? And then once a year, go get a CIMT. And if your arteries are healthy, then whatever you're doing, it seems to be working for you that year. Yeah, I mean, of those things you mentioned, I think I'm most excited about the CIMT because I, I really like to see the show me the money stuff. I like to see where the rubber meets the road. I like to see the actual progression or lack of progression or regression of disease mm -hmm. rather than risk factors because I think when we get into risk factors, I, I still I still have my doubts as to what it means because we've got all these risk factors are usually associated with some tied to some epidemiologic outcome, which I think is you just got so many so many confounders there and you know it's it's conditional and that type of stuff so i really like that advice to once a year get it and get somebody to put some you know put some uh, ky jelly on your neck and run an ultrasound up there and see what's going on and uh, let me talk about the cimt because you know I, I, some people will say it's not particularly accurate and obviously it depends on the skill of the ultra ultrasonographer uh doing it um some people will say that cac is the best test um, and there's other tests out there too, as well. That that uh, you know, I know there's like this, this pulse wave uh, stuff. Can you sort of rack and stack how you think things are? What what's the most predictor for you? If you if you could say, hey, get these three or four tests uh, for the the highest yield for somebody who's concerned about cardiovascular risk. How would you do that? So the, the caveat is, you know, if you're over the age of forty, you know, all three of these tests are likely reasonable for you. The only people that wouldn't be reasonable is you've already had an event. You've already had a heart attack or stroke. The calcium score test is not going to give you more information because you're already a high-risk individual. So if you've already had an event, the two tests you could consider are the CIMT to see is what you're doing currently in your lifestyle, your supplements and meds, is it working for you? Are you less likely to progress on to having another event? The endopat or the endothelial function test measures how much nitric oxide is getting released from your arteries. 
nitric oxide in the cardiovascular world. And one of the major benefits is it lowers your blood pressure. But nitric oxide also acts like Teflon, prevents stuff from sticking to your arteries in the first place. So if you have healthy nitric oxide where it's supposed to be, you're less likely to put plaque down in the arteries. If you're a 40 year old man who has no issues that you know of and you're fairly healthy, then the calcium score test may be reasonable. The calcium score test is probably my number one thing. That's what I usually recommend. Uh, you know, I do a lot of talks to firefighters and they're usually pretty active and quote, have no symptoms, but they're at high risk because of their, the professions, the stress and the you know toxins they get exposed to. Um, but the calcium score test is probably the best bang for the buck. You know, most places can be between hundred and two hundred dollars you know, low dose radiation takes five minutes. If you score zero, your risk of a heart attack is, you know, been quoted out as like 0.6% over the next five years. It's the best insurance policy that you're low risk. If your score is over 400, that's a high risk finding. You know, most likely you should see a cardiologist or somebody who knows how to deal with the, the results of a calcium score test. You know, generally going to recommend somebody over 400 undergo a stress test. A stress test is not a perfect test by any means. And it's not the best test to tell you, are you low risk or high risk of a heart attack? Because by the time you fail a stress test, you're way late into the game. You generally are gonna have a 70% blockage in one of your arteries by the time you fail a stress test. But you do a stress test in the setting of somebody having a high risk calcium score test to make sure that they don't have ischemia when they exercise so that they can continue to exercise. And somebody with a calcium score of a thousand, you know, they got a you know, well over 70% chance that one of their arteries is gonna be severely stenosed does not yet mean that they're gonna necessarily need a stent or bypass, but more likely not, if you got a score over a thousand, you're gonna get a you know, heart catheterization or angiogram to ensure you don't have triple vessel disease and you know, bypass surgery is recommended. But if your score is zero, you should feel pretty comfortable, you're low risk, keep doing what you're doing. Second test, then I would do the CMT. Third test is the, the endopatter endothelial function test. And, and just to clarify, there's some women asking, because you said man, and I'm, I'm, I'm sure the whole thing applies to women as well as far as the general algorithm, correct? Correct. Yeah. It's just any person over the age of 40. The reason that, you know, I'd say men, because typically heart disease happens about 10 years earlier than uh, it does for women, because estrogen tends to be protective for women. But if you're a woman with a strong family history and your mom, um, especially, uh, you know, you know, and you're in, in their 40s, you know, I tend to start screening people 10 years before their parents started having issues. So if a woman is 42 and has a lot of risk factors, I have no problem screening them as well. Um, what is, uh, so let me ask you about, um, you know, oh, exercise. So when you say exercise, some people will translate that into, I'm going to go jog, uh, you know, 70 miles a week. Some people will say, I'm going to go do some deadlifting. How does, uh, how do you feel exercise stacks up in the different types of exercise with regard to, uh, lowering your risk? So I honestly don't know how much on the data, um, pours out this way, but, you know, evolutionary makes much more sense to focus on the resistance training, you know, because without muscle mass, you're, uh, you're not very metabolically flexible and your muscles are doing, you know, a couple of things, you know, yes, it's burning sugar for you, but it's also, um, you know, doing some lipid, uh, you know, basically gets rid of a lot of the cholesterol that your system is uh, funneling through it. Um, so focus on people, you know, building enough muscle mass so that they stay metabolically healthy as they age, because if you become sarcopenic, you know, you break a hip, as you know, in your you know, line of work, you know, you don't have longevity when you break a hip. Um, so usually focusing on resistance training. If it's a person who's, you know, quote, healthy enough to, recommending interval training for doing the cardio if they're going to do cardio. Not a huge fan of chronic cardio unless that's something that you just absolutely love to do. Um, you know, doing a bunch of Ironmans or something like that, you know, is a amazing skill that people can develop, but it is not necessarily the healthiest thing to do from a cardiovascular standpoint. Mainly it's because of the chronic inflammation that gets put onto that person's system. So they train like crazy, they don't recover well enough, and then they go out there and run another you know, marathon the next day, and their body is basically just sucking down its stem cells trying to repair itself. So this is the reason why somebody who can be extremely fit can have a heart attack because their body is just wearing down so fast from the inside. You know, this is essentially the story of you know, Bob Harper, you know, perfect you know, physique on the outside, gentleman had, you know, elevated thing called lipoprotein A, you know, his arteries are probably like a 70 year old inside and he had an event while he was working out, you know, so just because, you know, you look healthy on the outside doesn't mean you're healthy on the inside and focusing on, you know, the resistant training and interval training is really what I would focus on from an exercise standpoint. Yeah, I think those are great points. And I do, I do appreciate the fact that just because you look healthy on the outside 
doesn't mean you're un healthy, unhealthy or healthy on the inside. I do find that some people, unfortunately, take that to the extreme and say that everybody that looks healthy on the inside is potentially sick. Because I think clearly you have more patients having heart attacks that don't look particularly healthy. You don't see a, probably a lot of ripped people with six packs coming into the OR for 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 open heart surgery. Typically, although it's, it's kind of like the I like to use that as the analogy of the 105 year old smoker. Yeah, you do see that occasionally. It doesn't mean everybody should be smoking. And so um, I think generally, you know, and this is just my bias. I think if you have a lot of muscle and you're relatively lean the odds of you be healthy, healthier on the inside is probably greater than the sort of the average 50-year-old male that we might see with, you know, 30 pounds of excess belly fat and completely sedentary. Would that be a fair statement? For sure, for sure. I mean, it's, you know, it's your, it's your metabolic flexibility. So, I mean, if you, if you got a big, you know, pan is full of inflammatory body fat, uh, it's hard to be metabolically healthy. Dr. Tarm, this has been just totally fascinating. I, I really, again, want to appreciate uh, your uh, your willingness to come on and share this with us. Can you, uh, let me ask you, are you seeing patients remotely? I know a lot of people are now doing this with uh, particularly COVID, but I mean, just as we advance, uh, you know, we'll do that. So one, do you see people remotely? And two, where are you located? And then three, where can people find you either with regard to getting hold of you as a patient? Uh, and also, if you have some social media you'd like to share. Sure. Well, first off, thank you for having me. This has been a you know a very fun conversation. Um, you know, I'm located in St. Louis, Missouri, and I do see patients remotely. Um, you know, if you're not in one of the states I'm licensed, you know, technically it's going to be more a second opinion educational consult. I can tell you what labs or what tests you should consider getting done, or can definitely teach you more about you know lifestyle and things such as that. But you know, if I actually had to prescribe something, you have to physically come see me at least once a year. Um, you know, I'm fairly active on Instagram. My handle is Dr. Twyman, Dr. Twyman, spelled T-W-Y-M-A-N. My website is drtwyman.com. And, you know, if you have information or questions about, you know, how your mitochondria work or heart disease or cholesterol, you know, just shoot me a direct message and happy to answer those for you. And do you do, how much of your time do you spend de-prescribing now? Are you, are you de-prescribing a lot? That's one of my favorite activities, honestly. So uh, deep prescribing is just getting people off stuff that they don't need to be on for, for a long time. I mean, yes, there's going to be times where, you know, um, I, you know, somebody gets, you know, banged up and they, you know, got a stent. Yeah, I'm going to leave them on their conventional medicine because that's standard of care. And it's also been shown that it helps them not have second events. But after a year, a lot of those things don't necessarily need to become lifetime medications. So start trying to work with them and uh, try to get them off things that they don't need. Well, thank you again so much. And I, I'm just going to, you'd be willing to see some of our folks if they needed, needed support, you know, online, that'd be fine for you. Of course. Yeah. I'd yeah. We got, like okay. I said, we got, you know, we get a lot of people that quite honestly, you know, as they come to these diets, uh, they do need, sometimes they need physician for, for support, particularly for that deep prescription type of thing. So I, I again, thank you. Thank you for, uh, so much for, for being here. Well, thank you. Um, I'm going to, guys, I'm going to, unless you have one other thing you want to say, I've got to shut I've got to go to another meeting here in just a second, but I appreciate, yeah, I'm going to, speaking of spending all day, I got, I think I've got four hours of straight meetings. I gotta do. <laughs> anyway, it's a pleasure uh, talking to you virtually. Hopefully I get to meet you in real life at some point. And again, keep doing what you're doing. I would love to see physicians out there that are willing to kind of step outside the, the mainstream to, to actually fix people, which I think is what we all signed up to do when we took that Hippocratic oath. So thank you, Dr. Twyman. Thank you. Have a great day, everyone. All right, guys. We're going to shut it down. We'll see you guys tomorrow. Take care now. Bye-bye.